Hey, welcome to episode number four of This Is Fet Life, where I bring you a new kinky interview with a Fet Life influencer every single week. And this week I sit down with Shinobi Sensei. He's one of the godfathers of the Manila Philippines kink scene. As his username suggests, we're gonna be talking a lot about rope in this episode. But we're also gonna be talking about the origins of the Manila kink scene and how it all started from early dial-up modems and how he was trying to learn kink and learn rope from just terrible sources back in the beginning and had to cobble it all together. Then we talk about how things are so much better now, but how you should also try to be safe when you're entering the kink community for the first time, especially as a girl. We also talk about the origins of rope work in Japan, passing out during play from like really strong orgasms and how to tell if a girl is coming. And this interview is actually really interesting because I recorded it after shooting a massage video with Shinobi Sensei and his partner, Jade. So just one or two nights beforehand, we'd met up at the Raffles Hotel there in Manila and Shinobi had tied up his partner. I don't really know anything about ropes, so I was just trying to like learn from him. And then I went ahead and massaged his partner and that video is not released yet, but if you want to get it as soon as it comes out, go to hunkhands.com, put in your email address, and then you're gonna be on the list to get that video as soon as it drops. And now I bring you Shinobi Sensei. Maybe you can start with the beginnings of the Manila kink community. Yeah. Yeah. So that was around, um, actually it got more active around 2010. Okay. When I, when I came into to Fat Life, um, somebody created a Manila Fat group. Mm. Um, before there was no, uh, there was no, there, there was no other Manila-based group that discusses about kink. It was all like other countries, mostly European, uh, Western countries. Mm-hmm. Um, there were a few from some of the Asian countries like Japan mm-hmm. and China, but aside from that, and then there's not, there's, there's no big like uh, discussion about it. The fact that most of the discussions from the other Asian groups discuss in their own language. Okay. So they, they discuss stuff in Chinese or Japanese. So most of Fet Life in Asia was mm-hmm. in a different language. Right. But in Manila Fet, um, a lot of the members can speak and write both in English and Tagalog. So it was a good venue for people to actually mix up, get mm-hmm. to meet you know other people. And uh, the original owner of Manila Fet, because um, he saw me post a lot of material, mm-hmm. he decided to make me one of the admins. Mm. And then later on, years later, but when he wasn't was, really... When was this? Like 2011, 2010, 2011. Okay. And though, though, that was the time that I was already starting to to st- to organize events, mm. uh, uh, public performances, uh, workshops. And I was just an admin at the time. Mm-hmm. But the actual owner of the group is... Uh, he's actually a lurker. He doesn't. He's not really mm-hmm. pretty active. He doesn't even go to the events. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just give him updates and stuff like that. But he doesn't really. He doesn't even come out to the munches. Mm-hmm. So he decided to. Uh, there was this one point where there were things that I needed to do with the group, but I couldn't do it because most of the settings are with the owner. Gotcha. So I asked him if it was okay if he can give me the group, and he gave me the group. So that was the start of uh, me owning Manila Fan. Hmm. But at about that time, it was already pretty, pretty established. It was the the, the first uh, group in Manila, and uh, the Munches was its main thing because you can. It was a neutral social gathering where you can actually come in and be yourself mm-hmm. um, in normal clothes. Of course, because we don't we don't we don't encourage them to come in their leathers and stuff. You know, <laughs> just come in in your normal clothes. Let's have coffee. Although although there were a few times that you know some weird dom just came with their <laughs> CC sub all dressed up in the mall. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a little weird, but um, just one incident. Uh, and then there are rules that are actually built to make sure that it's a safe environment. And then people are able to uh, 
basically network you know you mm-hmm. can meet new people people that you want a session to mm-hmm. and also yeah, I, just, I just joined it uh like yesterday yesterday because I, I was checking out your uh your workshop mm-hmm. um how many how many users are there now how many members right now there there's about there's about like a little less than three thousand mm. but it's not like all of these people i mean they're all from different corners of the globe not yeah. just the philippines but active members we have about um probably around a hundred that you know come in in and out yep. of the munches and the play parties and uh they some are regular attendees like they all there are always in the munch every month and then there are those that actually would disappear for several months and mm-hmm. then come to visit some of them are from abroad Whenever they visit the country, they drop by the munch. Mm-hmm. So it's probably one of the larger commun- communities like that in Southeast Asia. Um, right. right now, I th- I can't really say because um, there are actually like like uh, communities right now in other Asian countries, but in in the Philippines, uh, in Manila, this is the largest one, and it it broke off into smaller groups because of the area. Like there's one in Quezon City. Mm-hmm. Uh, organized by another community leader, which came from uh, Manila Fed. Mm-hmm. And then there's one in Makati, uh, the one that's being organized. It's called the Manila Gap. Mm-hmm. And then the venue is in Glorieta 5. And there's also one in the south. And there's one in Cebu. Mm-hmm. There's one in Cebu. Um, so you guys got like too big, basically. And then. Yeah, then this started. Because started, uh, yeah. some people find it difficult to go all the way to like the north or mm-hmm. people from the south they want to stay in the south and then people in makati don't want to travel too far but we end up like attending some of these matches every now and then if uh, we're available mm-hmm. or if the time permits so we also get to visit all these other munches and get to meet all these people that cannot come to us we go to them mm-hmm. and it's a it's an interesting like a mix of people you get a lot of interesting amazing uh um uh people that actually have a lot of different experiences and because when we started out um yeah when we started out since i was into rope most of the people that are in manila fed at the time were all into rope but why why is that when when i came out in 2008 i started nobody was discussing uh bdsm in public Hmm. there was no like group or focus discussion on a specific thing uh-huh. uh, about bondage and stuff like that domination and submission nothing like that it was all literature it was all just you know behind the the monitor and there's no real like exchange of information hmm. then in 2008 i decided i was going to perform publicly and then it was about time that that you know maybe filipinos should change the way they look at sexuality because at the time there was a big discussion about uh, family planning and there was this discussion between the church and Mm. the public and how they view family planning and how the the private sector view family planning and then of course all of this was all boiling down to poverty and overpopulation and some of the arguments were absolutely insane like you know like you know how the church does this stuff like, like, like they scare the wits out of you like you're gonna burn in hell if you do this you do that mm-hmm. so it was it was really crazy and uh, with my artist background I was like I felt like there's a responsibility for mm-hmm. me to to come out and say you know there's a different way of doing things mm-hmm. and there's another way of doing things and it may not be a better way but it's sure is different mm-hmm. so yeah just for people to th- think outside of the box yes yeah. Different different possibilities, mm. not just black white. That's right. So when I when I uh, when I started with rope um, in college, um, it was all for photography because I took fine arts as my course, and uh, everybody was doing the same thing. Um, everybody was doing painting, sculpture, photography. So I thought maybe I'd, I'd try something different. So I started learning the rope art. Mm-hmm. Which at the time was uh, was called Shibari, and that was the one I was researching in 1992, where the internet was crap, and there's only Netscape Navigator, 
and no Google, no YouTube. So I, I like was that your primary source <laughs> of information on ropes? Because was was like I, I didn't know how to like navigate the internet. At the yeah, time. I mean, was was there anything else? I mean, you go to the library, obviously nothing, right? There's nothing in the library. <laughs> I mean, here the years later when I was already like um, when I already had the group, people were, still, were saying, "Why didn't you go to Japan?" Like you know. <laughs> I was in college. I didn't have money. My parents were paying for my tuition yeah, fee. Like, flights were really expensive <laughs> back then, too. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's very difficult to get a visa to, to Japan yeah. just to go there to learn ropes. Because right now, like you know, I have members right now that just go fly to Japan and learn the ropes. Yeah. That's it. Like, they come back like I know stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. But before it was, it was like like a freaking desert, like. Mm-hmm. You're looking for an oasis or something. So, so like, no books. Uh, and then, did you know anybody else here who knew anything about ropes? No, uh, absolutely not. There was nobody here that knew anything about it. Hmm. And uh, maybe like some camping guys or something. <laughs> well, I was I was part of a mountaineering group. Okay, but they don't like you know they do knots and stuff uh, and climbing stuff. So like I can't like hey can I try you know tying you up? <laughs> you want to try something? But I was fortunate that because of my course, uh, since my college was the College of Fine Arts, mm-hmm. I had a lot of, you know, uh, classmates that were weird. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, let's do this for science. Like, you know, right. so they were more than willing to, you know, be uh, uh, tied up. And then we do photography. They like the photos and the photos became the the starting point it's like a conversation piece so the moment you you put up a photo and people look at it and they ask the question why hmm. so you don't uh when they came out with with bondage photography for rope there are two ways to show it there's the there's the like rough and dirty way to show it and then there's a way to show it it's elegant and beautiful and clean and hmm. symmetrical and it gives people this feeling of, like, they are actually, and at the time, because it was the, the only thing they were they were seeing, it was the first time they're seeing it, they were actually in awe of the photos. And, like, mm-hmm. they know that something is off, mm-hmm. but they like it anyway. Mm-hmm. And that's, how, how would you describe the, the rough and dirty versus the... Because um, there are some ways, like, if you're doing a photography for rope bondage, mm-hmm. you can tie it in a way where you have the actor, oh, sorry, the model, like, mm-hmm. act out like she's in trouble or in pain. Oh, or, gotcha, yeah. Right? And then you do a dirty photo, like, you know, do it on the ground where it's grimy and, you know. But if you do it in a studio, you mm-hmm. do it in a bedroom, you do it over clean sheets mm-hmm. with with beautiful um lighting Mm -hmm. it 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 gives you a different feeling it 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 tells you that it's pretty Mm -hmm. it's nice to look at it touches you emotionally but there's something wrong with the phone (laughs) you know something in your the back of your head that i think this is wrong Mm -hmm. but i like it Mm -hmm. so it's a it's a thing with uh i keep telling this to some of my artist friends that are a little younger than me because i'm 44 right now and they keep asking, you know, how do you how do you do that? How do you balance like um, your, your artwork and, and bondage? And they say, you know what? You're an artist, and an artist is a teacher. You have a responsibility to to reach out and teach people something. It doesn't matter what. It doesn't matter what. You'll you'll learn that out. You'll learn that along the way. But if you are an artist. You are supposed to transfer information. Okay. If somebody looks at your work and they say, I don't get it, you failed as an artist. Mm. So there's this thing that my art professor uh, was discussing like, the world we're living right now is born out of the resident, resident, uh, (coughs) sorry, uh, residue. I know. It's born out of the, uh, Renaissance period. Oh, okay, yeah. The artists like you know Da Vinci, Leonardo, the the turtles, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so Leo, Michelangelo, Michelangelo, oh, yeah. Donatello, the nunchucks, Splinter. Uh, no, Splinter is not an artist. <laughs> yeah, it's 
it's born out of the Renaissance period. Mm. Everything that you see here from the the cup where you're drinking your coffee from to the buildings that you see outside, they're all from the Renaissance period. Mm. And these are works of artists that just did their thing, you know. They they wanted to learn about something. They know how to illustrate it, like the medical, you know, anatomy mm. uh, drawings and the uh, mechanical drawings of Da Vinci, um, the 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 oil paintings and the depictions of you know uh, structures and and uh, um, uh, mechanical and engineering stuff. Mm. These were all their ideas. Now is the is your time. You are the artist of this age. Think about what your art is going to be like for people a hundred years from now. Like what you're doing right now, right? You're performing. You're an artist. You your craft. When you're good at something, it's not a craft. It's an art form. Hmm. So what you're doing right now is actually. And you're also already teaching, right? You're reaching out to people, telling them how things are supposed to be done, mm -hmm. how things can be done wrong, how things can be done right. You're already out, out there reaching out. And not only that, you reach out through your voice, your ideas, and your images. So you have video, you have photos. It's the same thing. Mm. So we are educating them right now. It doesn't matter what. Like right now, we're teaching people about their sexuality, how they're, they can do things outside of just this one thing. And then there are things that they can explore safely and uh, consensually with their, other, with, with their partners. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's really like, like that. It doesn't matter what you're, what you're doing, if it's kink. Mm -hmm. Also, there's this thing about, there's this thing about art. Um, also something that I learned from one of my professors, like whatever it is, what type of art form you're doing, there's always a hint of eroticism in it. Interesting. Okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. If you look at a photo and it moves you, mm. if you're looking at a photo, let's say, oh, like, for example, like the, the sculptures of like uh, David yeah. or... The Greek sculptures, like you can see the form, the face, the curl of the hair, it it, it touches you. It, it makes you like you'll 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 immediately say, "Hey, that's beautiful." Mm. The works of marble and stuff like that. So beauty is something connected to phys uh, physical uh, emotion, mm -hmm. right? That makes sense. And then people get connected physically through beauty. Mm -hmm. It's one of the characteristics. It doesn't have to be physical beauty. It has to can be intellectual beauty. But the concept is there. And you can see that in art. And it doesn't have to move. It's just there, static, staring at you. Mm -hmm. It can be a painting hanging on a wall. But you're still sitting there mm -hmm. enthralled by it. Mm -hmm. And you think, and how, how would you say there's there's eroticism? Like, because that, that, that's, like, when you said that, I was like, huh, that sounds right. But it, how, how would you describe it? It's it. How do you describe it? Others are pretty obvious. Hmm. Like you know, it it. Like, it's like playboy. yeah, it's like there. Playboy it's like has some eroticism. you know, like uh, there's this painting by Klimt called the Kiss. Hmm. It's there because it's the kiss. You see their faces touching each other, their bodies embracing each other. There's no nudity in it because the whole thing is covered in like a like a, a, a like a array of colors. But you can feel that particular emotion. Yeah. The heat, the passion. But it's not like, you know, you know it's a kiss. It's already there, obviously. But the rest of the photo still talks to you in a sexual manner. Um, other photos that can... Other examples are... What you call that? Oh, the Piera. The Actually, sculpture no. of Jesus Christ, Mary holding the uh, Christ, okay. cradling his dead body okay. when he was brought down from the cross. Some people think that's erotic. I don't know why. Me, I look at it, it's amazing because of the way the structure is made. Mm. The body is made, made out of marble and everything. That speaks out to me. So 
the way you translate eroticism doesn't necessarily have to be sexual in nature, mm. but it has to move you physically. Mm. Like you're connecting with it in an in a physical manner. <clears throat> that makes sense. Yeah, it's probably like because like evolutionarily, you know, like why would a monkey find something beautiful? Like it's it's probably hitched on to some sort of sexual thing. It's not like it just evolved by itself. It's right. like it's probably it's like um you know like like uh romantic love is is sort of a, a mix of like friendship and and then like the the nurturing instinct it's right. it's sort of like it's it's a blend of those it didn't just sort of evolve yeah, you know yeah. by itself it it uh it's just sort of uh that's it became why you useful. start out as friends right mm. mm-hmm. yeah. yeah right yeah it's just it's probably all like anciently some sort of sexual thing to beauty you know, it's like that waist to hip ratio is like the original, like, oh, that's beautiful. It's like those hips. But you have to think about it this way also. There are people that actually look at stuff, still find it sexual, but it might not be sexual to you. Mm. So it also depends on the way a person perceives things. Like I have this artist friend. He's an amazing painter. But he calls, he, he did an exhibit before of a series of paintings he called Shit. Okay. <laughs> so the concept is the colors that he uses for these oil paintings are all shit based, like browns and dirty greens and mm-hmm. corn yellow, you know. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and he makes them into these really crappy, you know, ugly losing ugly looking things. But in the exhibit, when you look at it, it's like you you know that he he has something mm. that you know the the painting is actually reaching out to you. Mm. Oh, another example, uh, Frida Kahlo. Mm-hmm. So the unibrow girl. Yeah, the unibrow. Okay. Girl. <laughs> so she had she had an accident where she got impaled through her vagina going out the back. Whoa! So like her vertebrae, her pelvis. She had a lot of, you know, bone injury because of that when she was younger. Wow. And she had to suffer that all her life. So in his in her paintings, you can actually see how she would depict her pain. Mm. She couldn't give birth because she couldn't bear children because mm. of that accident. They tried uh, a few times with his husband, who was also an artist. Um, I forgot his name. Uh, I'll remember later on, but yeah, he, he, she tried to to bear children uh, a few times, which failed, and she would paint um, depictions of these, you know, parts of her life, including how she she experiences pain in her body, mm-hmm. and you know that these photos are painful to look at, mm-hmm. but they're also sexy. Mm-hmm. I mean, for someone who's Who's practicing BDSM? Do you know how to play around with pain and pleasure? Sometimes these images can actually reach out to you and say, wow, that's hot. That makes sense. You know, it doesn't have to be perverted. It just has to like touch you in a way that that speaks to you, depending on your character. So some people may not like it. That's fine. It's same with, the B- with BDSM. Not everybody likes it. Not everybody has to know it. Mm-hmm. They don't have to do it, mm-hmm. you know. But there are people that actually do like it, and that's where we, mm-hmm. that's where that's where the one percent, like you know. Yeah, and it's, and it's a spectrum. Like some people will look at like uh, I, I was talking about your ropes mm-hmm. with this uh, this girl that is not supposedly not kinky, right? But uh, <laughs> but you know, you can just see her eyes light up a little bit. I'm like, oh, you're kind of interested, aren't you? She's like, no, 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 I'm not. I'm not. It's like, wow, you're saying no a lot. That's very interesting. Like strong no means a yes. Right? She's like, no, no. But like, you know, she she's not she's not about to be like suspended from the ceiling nude or something like that. Mm-hmm. But there's definitely she's on that spectrum. She's like, well, you know, I I can see how that might be a thing, maybe. Yeah, true. So like you look at the, you look at the paintings or something like that, and it's you might not be like, "Wow, this is my thing," but mm-hmm. you're like, ah, "I can, like, I, I get a taste of it." You know, there's something there. That's right. And there are people that are visual, and there are people that are. There's a term for people that actually look at words in an erotic manner. So that's why they like literature. Mm. I mean, poems and poetry and the play of words are sexy to them. So there's like that. 
there are people that actually look at uh, sculptures and structures. Like I know of, I have friends that are engineers. Mm-hmm. Like they look at buildings and they say, that's amazingly beautiful. Like, mm-hmm. you know, they know how to appreciate that type of um, aesthetic. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it takes, you know, different people with different, uh, sometimes it's really debate based on your character or your background. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's just like that. Cool. Let's, let's get back to, um, the, the, uh, the birth of fetishes in Manila. Um, so we were, we we're talking, it was like what, 2010, 2011. Yeah. That's, that's when you, uh, started as an admin of the group. Mm-hmm. And then you took over like three years later. Um, yeah, like around three years later, because 2011, when I I started some of the events, I was still just an admin. Mm-hmm. How many people were around at that time? Oh, not not too much. Um, when we started out, there was just a handful, like probably less than 50. Mm-hmm. And then... <laughs> just like in the group. Just but, like in the but group. Some of them right? were lurkers, like the, mm-hmm. like the the owner himself, right? And then when we started the munches, the first three months, there was just, just the three of us mm-hmm. <laughs> attending the munches every time. Mm-hmm. It was like, you know what? Let's forget this. We're, we're you know, it's not, gonna, it's not working. <laughs> it's just the three of us every time. So there were people like, yeah, we're going, we're going, we're going. And then on the day of the munch, they wouldn't come. So. Yeah. And then we stopped for a while. And then a few years later... I think that was, yeah, it was three or four years later. Um, one of the, we did Amistique. It's a, that's one of the, the big BDSM balls that we used to organize before all mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. And um, she attended. Mm-hmm. We became friends. What's, what's her name again? Uh, her name is Domina Aki. She's okay. in Japan now. She's, uh, she doesn't go to Fat Life anymore. Mm-hmm. But um, she's a, uh, post op, as they call that. So, so. yeah. So. Post, so originally a guy. guy. Mm-hmm. And she looks like an, she looks amazing. She looks like a freaking Barbie doll. And everybody loved her. She had amazingly beautiful red hair, long hair. And we met her at the time when, um, there was a wave of new people that are coming into Fat Life. And she says, you know what? Why don't we just restart the munch? Like people are starting to come in. And she became the, she became the, the beacon for that. Okay. <laughs> Cause every time she goes, just look for the girl with the red hair. <laughs> mm. So every time we go to the munch or we organize a munch, people started coming out. And when, when was this? So this was like, this was sort of the, the, like the fet life was probably becoming a better site. Right, right. Oh like yeah, yeah. More people are on the internet. More people are on the internet. Connections are faster. And, and then, then and then Fifty Shades. A mm-hmm. uh, Fifty Shades came in later. Was, so oh, just later. a few okay. years, uh, just uh, probably a couple of years ago. But from twenty, like twenty thirteen, um, that that was that was the thing. Like a a, a few years after that. And then people weren't that young yet, like 30s, you know, 20s, uh, late 20s, you mm-hmm. know. And then um, still not too many people coming in, but the bunch was growing uh, from five people. We The next month we started, we, we went to 10 okay. wow. and then 20 the following month. There was a time when we had like like 50 people in the bunch, like that whole area in, in Shangri-La was full of kinky people. Wow. <laughs> A coffee shop. And this would have been 2014? Like, yeah, 2014, 2015 okay. at the time. Yeah. So, and then like that, Fifty Shades came out and people started getting younger and younger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so now we're getting people that are early 20s and even like 19, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. And then we were starting to get careful because uh, the younger, we, we, we couldn't tell. Like, like people would come to the munch and it's like, how old are you? Do you have ID? It's like, because they look like, you know, I mean, you've seen, you've seen Jade. She's, it's, yeah, the first partner. time I met her, I thought she, I, I was freaking out because I thought she, was, she looked like she was freaking 12. <laughs> and she was 19 at the time. It's like, you know, and she was already with an older guy. Mm-hmm. So, who well, was also a friend of mine, and I kept asking myself, she's like, how old is this girl? Mm-hmm. Yeah, she's very short. And small. And just has, and like, a baby face. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. 
So she was even younger then. And then years later, when we were already together, um, we're still having the same problem with other people. It's like, how old is she again? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So, but, like, like, do you do you have sort of an age limit for the munches, or how does we work? do actually? Because um, technically, I mean, a munch is just like coffee with people. So, but but you still have true. But we try to keep people that are way too young. Mm-hmm. Like they have to be like on the age limit, like eighteen and up, just to make sure it's safe. Like we don't have parents like yeah. going into the much like you were discussing this with my kid. <laughs> you yes. don't want that. Nope, no, not at all. <laughs> or else we won't be able to go back there anymore. Like, all right. You know, Starbucks is gonna kill us. <laughs> Whatever. But yeah, we're trying to to do it that way. Make sure that so whenever we find out that a particular member is underage. We stick to, um, most of the admins stick to discussing stuff online mm. rather than asking them to go to the munch until they are like 18, 19, and 20. You know, mm. Then go ahead. Because, like, if you ban, I mean, if, if you kick somebody out of a group, they'll mm-hmm. just create a new account. And right. Yeah. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's the internet. What are you going to do? It's proper. It's just, it's, it's better to just be open and engage them mm-hmm. with, um, just talking to them and telling them, you know what, this is what we're going to do. And this is what you're going to do. You can learn. You can uh, ask questions. You can uh, have, you know, all of this. But let's try not to do this first. Like, you take it step by step. Although we can't, um, like, save everybody, we have had incidences of abuse online. Mm-hmm. Not just online, even in real life, because sometimes they get like creeps messaging them like, hey, I want to meet you. And I have a place here and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Rather than going to a munch, they go to a bar, meet the guy, have a few drinks, go to the room. Right. And then that's it. Yeah. The moment you close the door, you're screwed. There's nothing you can do. And the only thing you can do the following day is, you know, if you can, if you manage to to file a case because mm. mostly most of the time the, the argument there is like she went to my room she met me she agreed to that so it's very difficult we've, we've had yeah. a lot of reports like that and it's so sad but like What's, I said like if, if somebody's new and getting into like if you're that you know 20 year old or whatever <laughs> um, and you're like getting into or you're just interested, right? You're just like, I don't know if I like this or not. Like, mm-hmm. how, what's, like, so you don't want to meet random people in their hotel rooms or in a right, bar. Right. Well, what's what's the smart way to do it? This The smart way to do it is actually, the munch is actually the best way. Because you go in and you meet a bunch of people mm-hmm. that are uh, just there to welcome you. And then they're there to talk to you, get to know you, you get to know them. Um get to learn more because we already discussed stuff online like do's and don'ts uh, as warnings and there's already like hundreds and hundreds of threads uh, discussing about um, the dangers of like doing that mm-hmm. and um, we, we also do that during munches like we also discuss this we're open to their questions like of course if you're into this you're starting out you can just you can't just just go to your friends and you know what I like to tie up girls and you know, or girls who get you know I like it I like to get spanked and burned and choked you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> your friends are gonna look at you like you're sick, man. Like you know. Mm-hmm. So the munch is something that's it, it's not a they're not gonna judge you. They will accept you for who you are, listen to your story, and w- what you're interested in, and even if you don't speak, you can just sit there and listen to how people discuss stuff and talk about stuff and eventually you will you know understand it and it's uh rather than randomly like meeting people i'm I'm not saying that's uh like everyone is is a creep there are legitimate people out there but the munch became the the safest place for them it's like a Mm -hmm. a neutral ground where where they can meet safely and securely. Yeah. If a per- person they want to meet does not want to meet in the munch. Yeah, it's a bad sign. It's it's for them. It's we call it a red flag. Yeah. So if that if that person does not mean it's like nah, I you know. I do I'm, my own thing. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a afraid of wolf. You know, I'm I'm, I'm very uh, part of with my privacy and stuff. You know, I don't mm-hmm. want people you know mm-hmm. messing up with you know my identity and so on and so forth. For us, if. 
I mean, it's okay. I mean, we understand you want to keep your privacy, but the chances of you getting being able to do a session with an absolute in- newcomer who has no idea what's going to happen is going to be slim. Mm-hmm. And that's the that's the goal of the the munches. Also, like so everybody's been like vetted basically. I mean, right. not, not, mm-hmm. not like in a formal way, but like you're at least able to show up and like talk mm, to people right. and like at least socialize at that level. So there's, there's some sort of a minimum bar of, That's right. and then people probably know you from online posting. So, and then, yeah, most of the admins and the people that have been in Fet Life, uh, Manila Fet for a while and all the other local groups, they become, you know, their contact person. Like, can you, can you tell me about this person? Do you know this guy? You know? mm-hmm. Cause, um, because of our, you know, experience and like this, like we've met already, mm-hmm. right? So if somebody asks me, then I can bet for you. Mm-hmm. And it's the same with everyone else. Like if I've seen them in the munch and I've talked to them, spoke to them, or they've been into, they've attended some of the workshops or events. I get, I make it a point to actually like talk to people and um, ask them how they are, you know, get to know them a little bit. Because eventually, down the line, some people will ask you, "Have you met this person?" And yeah, it, it's a um, it's a good way to to uh, like at the very least, like give people idea. Like, if I have someone that I'm not really sure, like I tell them I met them a couple of times. I'm not really sure about how he is in the bedroom, but he seems to be a nice guy. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be best to just have coffee first. Mm-hmm. So I give suggestions. You know, you could have coffee first. Ask them to go to a neutral area, like, talk about it. It's like that meet the parents, right. like, <laughs> like the circle of trust. That's the, <laughs> that's the thing, you know, they, oh, I'm going to, because right now there's this thing, like they have this daddy baby girl thing, mm-hmm. right, going on. And this is really weird because before it was like Dom's son, mm-hmm. and then there was a slave, and then there was a submissive top bottom thing, and then rope top and rope bottom. And now it's daddy baby girl. So this is a new sort of kink that people are it's like the like new fashionable the fashion thing yeah because most of the people that were from from these older like uh, categories mm. aged out mm. and then they're not really as active they just come in occasionally and they all just play with the with the tenured people you know same age as they are but because of the influx of younger newer people there's a lot of baby girls and baby boys mm-hmm. that want older guys to mentor them or to teach them or to so gotcha. whenever they bring a person over to that's what they say it's like, beat, beat the parents <laughs> <laughs> so this is my daddy shinobi you know <laughs> the hell <laughs> <laughs> and the guy's older than me so he's like <laughs> whatever interesting so uh so the baby girl like daddy thing that's that's more of just because of 50 shades there's more people aware of BDSM. Mm-hmm. So you, you've got that younger influx. And yeah. then you've always, and you just have some older people. So it's just like supply demand in a way. Something like that, <laughs> right? Because before the that age play thing, yeah. is it age play? I mean, you, you're, you can be older, but play a younger role. Right, okay. Mm-hmm. But now it's actually age play. Like, I mean, like Jade and I, I'm 44, she's 24. Mm-hmm. So we play around with the idea, but she's more submissive than baby girl. Mm-hmm. She gets bratty every now and then, but that's that's her, like you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, but there are those that actually are into the baby girl dynamic. Like they do, you know, they still go to the munches with with bottles with them and you know mm-hmm. be- teddy bears and pacifiers pacifiers and stuff <laughs> and they still like their candy and they still like their Jollibee and spaghetti so yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we don't have to be a baby girl to like Jollibee spaghetti <laughs> crazy <laughs> I don't <laughs> but <laughs> because every time we do the munch uh, at 7pm we mm. we go out and have dinner it's like mm. the first thing we ask like Hey, where do you guys want to eat? Of course, the older guys are like, well, let's go to like this restaurant. It's like, let's go to a steakhouse. They, yeah, a steakhouse, <laughs> right? And all these girls are like, no, let's go to Jolly Bean, spaghetti, and Jolly Chicken. Like, <laughs> Everybody's like, no. <laughs> and there's a lot of them compared to us. Like, there's going to be like four dogs and like all of these. Like, you feel like a daycare center, man. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so we keep complaining. It feels like a freaking daycare. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, where should we take the conversation? I don't know. 
We've been all over the place. It's been good. Um, so we've talked about okay. it. We talked about art and sensuality. Um, we talked a little bit about ropes, actually not that much. Um, mm. Kind of how Fet Life, you know, in Manila started. What, what, what was what was it like before? Like, because you were talking about 2010, 2011, you kind of got onto Fet Life. Mm-hmm. Um, Prior to that. Yeah, because I mean, you were into this in, like, 92? 92, right. That's when you started? I mean, from 92 to 2010, what was going on in, well, in, the, in Manila? I wasn't really very active then publicly because I was also still learning. Hmm. Because of the scarcity of the information and, hmm. the, you know, the material that I get, it actually took me seven years to learn the basic. Just the basic. And then mm-hmm. practicing is a different thing. Mm-hmm. So... Since rope, shibari, the original like like uh, source material is from a martial arts form. It's called Torinawa Jutsu. Oh, really? Yeah. Know. So, um, and each martial art form has this this derivative of it. Like judo and jujitsu is made to tackle and uh, bring your opponent down. Okay. The moment they're down, that's when you pull out the rope and start tying them. Huh. So the martial art itself, Torinawa Jutsu, the weapon of choice is a chain with a weight on the end. And it's, that's the one that they use to grapple. And uh, it doesn't even have to be a chain. It can be a piece of rope mm-hmm. with a weighted end or a sickle on the, the part. We've, we've seen some of these um, weapons shown in, in movies. Like mm-hmm. They're usually handheld by ninjas or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's pretty much the same. It's, um, it's also called like a monkey fist or something? Something like that. And then there's another derivative where the weighted end is actually a blade. Mm-hmm. A it's like blade. in Kill Bill. Right, right. The, the Japanese schoolgirl oh, yeah. assassin. Mm. So it's, it's, it's like that. And um, in Japan, basically, during the feudal age, most of the steel is, uh, is actually... Uh, because they don't have enough uh, iron or metal compared to the West. Okay. So it's, very, it's, it's a scarce um, uh, resource. Hmm. And they always uh, reserve that for armor. Uh, swords, of course, mm-hmm. and bladed weapons like spears, arrowheads, and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, mostly armor and swords. So, for binding prisoners of war in the West, they have they have chains and shackles and stuff, right? Okay. Uh, Japan doesn't. So mm. they they use whatever is abundant. Mm. They have a lot of hemp rope. Interesting, because it's a fishing, pretty much the same as the Philippines. It's an island country. They have fishing. They have a lot of rope. Yeah. They use rope. Hmm. So that's how they, they, they bind their prisoners of war. But anything in Japan is an art form. Hmm. From drinking your tea to taking a shit. Hmm. If you've seen toilets in Japan. Even the 7-Elevens. <laughs> if you're good at it, yeah. it's called an art form. Yeah. <laughs> if you're good at creating toilets, <laughs> yeah. it's an art form. So, so even the way they're tying their prisoners... Uh, historically, there's a technique for every like uh, province, so a person would know because after they tie up their 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 prisoners, they would be brought to wherever they they need to be brought to. Like if they need to be brought to back their, to their town where they come from, or to the to answer to the shogunate or whatever, they need to uh, bring them to another location. So. The way they're bound was would actually tell them would actually tell people looking at them where the person was caught, what's their rank, and what's their crime. Really? So it was it was like a communication. It's a tool. form, yeah. It's a form of communication tool. So you could have just tied them up just right. in the easiest way possible and like attached a note, mm-hmm. but for but some yeah. reason they decided to mm-hmm. embed messages. That's that's in way the style. too easy. Like okay. you know, in the West they just put you like billboard in front of your yeah. face, or just like, like you brand know. you or something. Yeah, rapist. Yeah, you know? yeah. Huh. Horse stealer, you know. <laughs> this one, ah, it's like you know, you have to look at the ropes. Like, ah, I know where that come from, you know. Interesting. So, so, th- so that's how the tradition was so. That has yeah, how the tradition is, and then uh, years later, um, and this is all being taught in Japan all throughout, even after the feudal age, it's still being taught in Japan. 
up to a point that during World War II, and this is how um, the U.S. discovered that Jap- Japanese were kinky, because during World War II, there were there were reports of or incidences of when they captured Japanese uh, prisoners of war, they had small like booklets or pamphlets with them that illustrate how to tie up a person. But the drawings, the 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 the, the prisoners mm-hmm. were all female. Mm-hmm. So of course these are guys. They're men. Like they look at it, it's the you know porn. Mm. So it's it's kind of like um, it's it's kind of like the uh, what is it like the uh, the people that you're supposed to kill in Iraq or whatever. Mm-hmm. They were like in a plane card deck uh-huh. because people use the cards, so they see the photos. Right. So it's like if you take your manual and you make it into like a little porn and you know mm-hmm. the porn magna magna. What, I'm saying it wrong. Manga. Manga. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, the guys will actually flip through it and maybe they'll learn at the same time. Yeah. Something like that. Something like that. Plus, it's, you know, they're, it's war. They're away from their own. It's something that to, just to entertain them. Yeah. Like but they won't these, throw it away, though, yeah. actually. But these are material that actually are supposed to teach you something. Mm-hmm. And then when the Americans are saying, oh, Americans, uh, Japanese are so, you know, kinky. You know? Yeah. And um, even the story that I told you... Um, when uh, the way I was exposed to this, my uncle came from Japan and he came home with a stack of magazines, like really high. And most of them are like Western magazines, like but, Penthouse. Okay. Uh, so they, these weren't just magazines. These were, Yeah, it was like, you know, <laughs> like glossy, like glossy magazines, mm-hmm. Hustler, Playboy. It wasn't National Geographic. It was, <laughs> these, were, <laughs> these were the good ones. I wish they were. I, I love National Geographic. <laughs> But and then all of all of that stack of mm. magazines, there was this one magazine that featured an image of a girl on the cover, where from the neck down she was all silhouette, but she was bound. There were ropes, you know, like sticking in every direction, and she was suspended in midair. And that that caught my attention because all the other magazines, they could see you could see the photos, like they're all like lighted, studio style, right. and this was in reverse, like. You can't see anything because there were rules in Japan that you're not supposed, like, two nipples at a time or you're not supposed to show pubic hair. What's the two nipples at a time? Um, you can only show one? You can only show one, I think. Okay. So you can show the breast but not the nipple, like, uh-huh. you know, both of them at the same time. Okay, okay. So they had to play around with light. They had to play around with material. They had to play around with the rope the way it won't show these parts and make it okay for them to take a photo. Uh, years later, I found out that this magazine was a publication by Kitan Club, which is one of the major publishers in Japan that that uh, produces uh, bondage material mm. in Japan. And those are very difficult to find. Mm. My aunt burned mine when she found it <laughs> in my drawer and never saw it again. But that that started me out. And uh, how many pages would this have been? In would have been like a like forty page kind of magazine. Something. It's like a that. it's it's pretty much the same like Hustler and a Playboy. Okay. It's it's thick. It's because uh, it's made out of glossy. Yeah, like the pages are thick. It's and it's like every page like, would have a photo. Pretty much. Um, no, there was all, there was illustration, there was story, but they were all in Japanese. Mm-hmm. So. I can understand them, but I'm sure they were probably erotic, like uh, stories, yeah. and articles. Well, like so, like this magazine. Like what else? What else was in there? Um, so was it all? Was it all ropes? Or it was all rope. It was all ropes. It was all rope. That's wow. the thing. And um, they, I didn't see any like women would be tied up to the bed, suspended on the ceiling, or tied up to a bamboo pole or some mm-hmm. sort. And it's amazing. It's a uh, and the fact that I can't understand all the other um, text because it's it's written in a different language, it's the photos that actually just captured me, and that's it. Mm. And how, can, how old were you at that time? I was, I think I was seventeen. Okay, yeah. I was uh, I was in high school, yeah. going into college, and yeah, that 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 kind of stuck to me. So when I came into college, I I, I remember that. And I wanted to learn it. And I remember seeing in one of the pages in English, just there was a few like ads like written in, in English, like English, English, <laughs> that it's what's called Shiba, Shibari. Mm. 
And that's how I started, you know, looking at it, looking for it. Or <laughs> during the time with Netscape Navigator, like you go type in Japanese, you know, bondage. Mm. And then the website would open up. It's like, hey, here it is. There's a photo of a, it's not a photo. It's actually a drawing of a samurai okay. bound in this manner. But all the text is in Japanese. Mm. So what I, what I had to do then, the reason why it took me a while to, to learn it, because I had to reverse engineer <laughs> how the ropes were going around oh, oh, wow. visually rather than there's like text explaining yeah. and there's no YouTube. Yeah. It's not a video. These are like photos of drawings from old Japanese texts on how to, how the rope goes around where. Damn. <laughs> 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 like while you're waiting for it to load. Yeah, so while like, you're waiting for it to load. It's like, like, like the the thing that the internet was the worst at at that time was right. like big files. Dial up and, and that was the only way you could do it. You had to buy that card thing. And yeah, your mom picks up the phone and like, what? Yeah. <laughs> wow. So, so, so you had, you had this magazine and then like, when, when was it that you sort of discovered other people, you know, in BDSM or kink or whatever in Manila, like, like, cause, cause you were just, you were doing this completely by yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when did, when did you start to connect with, with other people? The, the first connection was in my college mm -hmm. when I was doing, um, work, working on my, my projects, I wanted to, uh, do photography because that was one of my hobbies. Mm -hmm. I did photography and um, I wanted to take pictures of the things that I was working on. And like, like, like I mentioned a while ago, I, I was fortunate that there were, like I have classmates that are willing mm -hmm. to, to model for this, but they were not into King. They were, we were laughing about it. Yeah. Like, you know, you know, it would be interesting to do this when you're like this, so on and so forth, <laughs> you know, but they weren't really into that. Like, yeah. they were like, just kidding. Yeah. And then, uh, like, a couple of years into it, I, I, I met someone. Uh, I met a girl that was into it. She was the same age as I was, around 7, 16, 17, 18 years old. And that was around 2000 and... I'm sorry, 1997. Mm. 97, 98. Uh, when I met her, she she modeled for me. And uh, we were doing stuff together. And then she was making suggestions like, you know what? Can we do this? Or can you do this to me? Mm -hmm. And she was giving me ideas about spanking and uh, pinching and, you know, uh, putting her in a position like, you know. So she was actually mm -hmm. getting years later. I didn't know it that then back then. But years later, I didn't understand what subspace was mm. i didn't understand what um uh rope frenzy was or rope sub was i didn't understand what that was there was a type of person that actually gets aroused by binding mm -hmm. the fact that they lose control it arouses them and this girl was that girl she would uh go into a zone a subspace at the time where I did not understand. She would go into a zone where she just, re her whole body just relaxes and just she just accepts everything that's, uh, you know, done to her. Except uh, there are times that you need to, she likes like sharp, like mm -hmm. how Jade is. Like mm -hmm. she, she wants to have like those sharp, sudden sensation mm -hmm. to just like rattle or jar her out of it. Right. And then it goes, it goes deeper. Mm -hmm. It puts her in a deeper state. So she would actually suggest, like, can you spank me or mm -hmm. can you choke me a little bit? Can mm -hmm. you hold me here? Can you pull my hair? Mm -hmm. And was this while you're doing like a like a shoot or this is like, oh, let's just practice on the sides. Yeah, like that. practice on the side yeah. and doing a shoot. And we became a couple. Mm -hmm. And that's that just blew up because we can do things like we can have sex. Mm -hmm. And she was she was really full of ideas. Mm -hmm. And this was all born of reading literature. Mm -hmm. Because she likes reading literature, and at the time, like, like yeah, what kind of literature would? would oh, have, she was she was restraints. way into. Um, there's a I don't know if you've heard about this book, the story of O. I've heard of it. Yeah, I haven't read it. It's yeah. by Pauline Regé. She's a French writer, mm -hmm. 
And the book is is the story of a submissive girl. She's mm. her name is O, which also a symbol for zero. She mm. becomes an object, not mm. a person, who is sent out sent to a training facility or a training house where a female dom trains her to be submissive for her dom. Mm. So she was really into that. And even Anne Rice created a series of books um, under a different pen name, Anne Recolicure. And she created the beauty series. So it was a story of Sleeping Beauty in a, told in a different way mm. where the, the prince was actually into uh, having sex with necrophilia girls. Like, okay, yeah. you know, like dead? they're sleeping, yeah. Oh, oh, okay, sleeping. So the All way right. uh-huh. the okay. way that he woke sense. up, yeah. Sleeping Beauty, was not by a kiss. Uh-huh. He straight up, like, <laughs> fucked her. her. <laughs> That's it. That's why she woke up, you know. 100 years, first time you get fucked. Definitely wake up. <laughs> I would, I would do it. I definitely wake you up. More than a kiss. And she goes to a journey of, like, BDSM. Like, it's really graphic, the way Snow White Anne Rice created this, right? <laughs> Something like That's that. That's very interesting. And then she also wrote another book. It's called Exit to Eden. Mm. It's a modern story where there's an island where you can pay to stay for six months. And then you get you either become a submissive or you are a uh, top. Mm. Usually the submissive serves their clients that are like rich people mm. that attend the place. Like, you know. Uh, Mr. Gray style. Okay. You know. So, but the moment you sign the contract after leaving the airport from wherever you're coming from, you get strapped to a plane without your clothes on, and then you're, you're, uh, you land on the island, and you're all like let out, mm-hmm. all naked, sorted out, and then put into different houses for training mm-hmm. and uh, use. Mm-hmm. If you're good or if you like what your role is, you get to stay for two years. Mm. And the thing was that the concept there is like the doms that are ones that are running the place, they have this thing like, sorry, like we exist to provide something that they need. So it's like that symbiotic relationship. Like if there's someone that's submissive, the dom cannot exist without a submissive mm. and vice versa. You can't be submissive if you're not submissive to anyone, someone else. So that's the way the story is written by, by Anne Rice. It's really amazing. It's called Exit to Eden. So yeah, so this girl is really yeah. heavy She's into literature. And uh, <laughs> that's how she, she kind of introduced me into it. And then it, during our relationship, playing around, it just... You know, it just went out. Like, yeah. you know, let's do this, let's do that. And then eventually, it kind of dawned into me, like, I kind of like this. Mm. So I started doing more of it. Like, I started learning just not just the rope. I started learning how to do impact play. I started to, to learn how to do wax play mm. properly. Um, sensual massage. Mm-hmm. That was a, a, there was a thing, there was a stage where I actually had to learn that a little bit because, you know, I had to learn about the anatomy, how the body works, where the erogenous zones, you know. And then uh, um, the other things like edge play, choking, um, heavy impact, like paddles mm-hmm. and crops. So how are you like, because like you're, like you're with a girl, she likes... Um you know, like new things. You're like, all right, so let's mm-hmm. see where this goes. How did, how did you like research the different areas? If you're like, all right, impact play, do you, is that, does that just happen organically or you would read, there was a resource and then you would try things like there was a catalog that you were kind of going through or <laughs> with, with this girl, it was kind of exploratory. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I didn't have any material. Mm-hmm. It's more like, uh, like, like feeling your way through it. Mm-hmm. But eventually Years later, I, I, I felt the need to be responsible enough to at least know, like, what am I doing wrong and what am I doing right? Mm-hmm. And, but but, but there weren't, like, resources back then. So it's just sort of, or what time was this? I think the two, 2000 was around the time when I started mm. getting stuff. Because 1997, 98, 99, um, it was all just, you know, feeling your way through it. 
the rope, I kind of already have an idea how to do that. But all the other stuff, it was all just light stuff. I didn't do any like heavy stuff until I got material mm. around the 2000s when the internet came out a little better. Mm-hmm. And that's when, that's when things started to, to evolve further. So there were, there were sites that are now featuring BDSM. And you would look at the images and the videos and not look at how it's done, but look at the background. Like, can I can, like, can I tell what type of material they're using? Mm-hmm. Is that real wood or is that like fake stuff? Cause they're actually like during the 2000s, there were BDSM stuff that were fake. Hmm. Like, <laughs> well, like, what does that mean? Does like, that mean? they're not really tied down. Like, you can see the, the rope on their wrist, but they're actually just holding to the corners of the bed. Oh, uh, okay. And yeah. then they would show you, like, a person, like, holding this, like, big 2 by 4 or 2 by 2 Yeah. Using it as a paddle. But it's not really a paddle. Like, they do a, a hitting motion, but they're cut. And then, you know, gotcha. you see something. You think they're hitting something, but it's not real. And then I discovered insects. Mm, what is that? I-N-S-E-X dot com. Okay. It's, it used to be owned by the people with uh, kink dot, kink.com. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they sold that company or they sold that website to, uh, I don't know, they are Austrian or German owners. And then they created kink.com in the US. So it's kind of the original BDSM. The original spot. one. And the thing, the interesting about that with insects is they did some really extreme stuff with girls that are amazingly durable and, you know, they can take a lot of positive punishment. Durable. But the, I like it. <laughs> the interesting part about it is that before they do stuff, they have this interview stage where uh-huh. they actually talk to the girl and ask them, what do you like? How do you like it? And what are the things that you don't like? Mm. And then during the play, these things, they really, the, the no-nos, mm. like the hard limits, we call them the hard limits, they really don't do that. Mm. But everything else that the girl agrees to, or she says, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, they they do it to her and take it up a notch. Mm. And she just, she just goes all out. Mm. And then after all of that, like after 45 minutes of all that punishment and pain and bruising and sweating and pissing and drooling, at the end of the session, they would actually have like another interview and say, what are the things that you... So you know that the girl at the start is experiencing this and at the end is still safe. Mm -hmm. So because a lot of the BDSM videos that came out before will just show you the the scene and it will give you an idea that the girl was you know they have a scene where the girl was captured or you know, abducted and then gang raped while bound and stuff like that and then she was just left behind in this abandoned you know room there's you're thinking oh so that's how bdsm is you abduct a girl you tie up a girl you fuck her and then you leave her mm-hmm. so there were people perverted like that idea mm-hmm. but it's all a scene. It's all in the mind. It's all uh, staged. Yeah, so the girl might not even be into it because there might not even be, any, be anything really happening. That's right. That could just be editing. And... That's right. But, but with insects, they so they... showed that the girl is into it. They Graphically, they show everything. Like, you know, during the scene, they do everything. And then at the end of the scene, they interview the girl and say, you know what? That's really cool. Yeah. They... Somebody made a video, um, the, uh, a movie, which is which is titled Kink. Okay. Made by, directed by, uh, who's that guy? The guy who uh, created this movie with, you know, where they're supposed to assassinate the the Korean president. Oh, um, Seth Rogen. Or the other guy. Yeah, uh, Franco, James Franco. James Franco. He created he he did an indie independent movie mm-hmm. which featured Kink mm-hmm. and he went to uh, Kink Inc in in California the the makers of you know some of the the best 
um, BDSM videos online right now. It's a big business for them. Mm-hmm. And he interviewed them and how it works. Gotcha. And it's a, it's an amazing, you know, look into the BDSM industry. How out. they pick up their models, how they choose the people, how the production works, how they, they even have this, like, she, he took a, a video of them sitting down and talking about who's handling which like they have different LOBs like, like they have a, they have one for uh, machine uh, fucking machines they have one for gay guys and they have one for girls on girls and they have one for uh, ga- I know, uh, what you call that bound gang bangs okay wow so and they're handled by different like, like they have like a team leader for each so they know their and market like, yeah and then they're talking about why is your sales low this month, you know? So it's like a weekly or bi weekly or monthly business meeting. And they're actually looking into that. Like, okay, so it's not just cake, you know? They're actually talking about big business. And they're talking about money in like, you know, millions, hundreds of thousands. Like this week, you got only $200,000 because I think it's the. The, the election season and you know <laughs> that's so funny like, okay <laughs> but it's an interesting peek into I gotta check the, that out the BDSM yeah it's it's directed by James Franco it's entirely key. I have a copy of it at home it's an interesting movie yeah awesome so uh Where are we yeah, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I, I a little bit <laughs> We're, we're talking about like uh, you got your girlfriend who mm-hmm. was into it, um, and then the different like influences and like so insects was a big thing because they had mm-hmm. the really good BDSM showed, stuff. Yeah, it showed you how uh, things can be done the right way. Yeah. So like it also ta- it also taught you how to negotiate. Hmm. Like you have to sit down and talk with your partner first and ask them what is it that you like. And what is it that you don't like? Mm. So, in, in effect, when you do have a session and you do things that she likes, that you also like, you end up, you both end up with a, a great experience. Mm. You can find that overlap. Right. So, the dom that has an experience skill set, because if, if, if I only have like just one skill set, like if I only do rope, then it would be best for me to look for someone that's just with rope first. Right. To start up with rope. Because if you look for someone that is into heavy impact play and the only thing you do is rope and you do slapping like this, it's she's going to hate it. Yeah. You know? Because they know how... You know, you have, if a person says, I'm into impact play, you have to be... You have to have your A game. And like, you know how... You, when you slap, your hands are supposed to get red. Mm. That's it. Or else they're going to tell you. They're very vocal. Women, submissive women, they're very vocal. They will straight out tell you, like, that was shit. <laughs> exactly the opposite of what you would think, right? <laughs> right. So, because they, they know what they want. Submissive women compared to guys. Sub- guys are submissive in a way that they will just take anything. Submissive women are very specific. Hmm. Probably because, like, they can, they can get it. Like, they there's, can get there's, it. there's more... Like the supply demand mm-hmm. balance is a little different, this, and the sensation for them is is uh, is is more intense. Mm. The way a woman's biology is different, because of course women are, you know, gifted with uh, giving birth. Right. They actually have a a, a hormone that uh, in, secretes a. a uh, a feeling of it's like morphine mm-hmm. for the body but it's natural mm. so when a female's body experiences pain panic danger mm. it secretes that hormone and rather than in a bondage situation it actually is euphoric hmm. so it kind of counteracts yeah kind of keeps them mm-hmm. uh, like like from from fully panicking something like that right so remember when you played with Jaden and you said yeah. it got you tired? Yeah. That's how she works. Mm-hmm. She she actually taps into that mm-hmm. and she can take more and more and more. 
And after that, she when when that goes down, the adrenaline goes down, the the that that feeling goes down. Mm-hmm. That's when she 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 gets spent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a uh, dopamine, and uh, there's one more, which is all connected to childbirth. Mm-hmm. It's it's something that helps them cope with the pain of childbirth. Interesting. Yeah. So I, imagine I heard that women have a higher pain threshold. Right. So imagine if you're if you're doing BDSM to a female that has a higher, you know, pain threshold, you're up for serious business there because mm. you sh- be ready to like sweat and get a workout, you know, because it's 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 a uh, it's something natural to them, mm. and it's not it's not. Um, uh, like it's something that they can turn off. It's just there. Yeah, I've I've, I've, I've wondered why why it is that women like pretty, pretty universally, not everybody, but they they tend to like sort of rough rough sex. You know, like being restrained a little bit. You know, it's like like why why is that? I don't know. I don't like. I've thought maybe it's um something about how. Like if you sort of pussy out at the last moment as a guy, oh yeah, then uh, <laughs> then like it means you're not genetically fit, you know. If you're like gonna like go, you know, like you, you sort of got it in you mm-hmm. to be a little bit a little bit of an asshole to like close the deal, you know. Like women sort of don't like it, but they kind of respect it in a way because they want their kids genetically mm-hmm. to like be closers, you know, to like right. get the get the job done, you know. It's like as as uh you know it might not be politically correct but um you know it's sort of like in the back of their head they're like this guy's a bit of an asshole but i kind of like it you know that's true that's true it's because of that particular uh characteristic Mm. you know so when you and that's what that's also part of the reason like i was explaining a while ago the the fact that they know exactly what they want Mm. because they're they know how their body works they can feel it and they know exactly when it comes up and when it comes out. And mm-hmm. um, us, we couldn't tell. Like, we could tell if they're coming or not. You know, mm-hmm. most of the time, we're, we just, like, they're watching. But we can't really tell if they're do- if they're if if it's happening. Yeah, I have no idea. Um, I've had a few tells from all my, from my experience from before. But it's still not, like, 100% no. accurate. Mm-hmm. Um, Jade is uh, particularly, she takes a while to get. To, to get really um, ex- one of the rare examples. Um, <laughs> I mentioned that the girl that you met earlier that night mm-hmm. was also a friend of mine. She's a little bit, you know, easier too. She, she said she had a, uh, a dom before who mm-hmm. made her count her orgasms. And if she lost count, she would get punished. Mm-hmm. So afterwards she was like, yeah, I came seven times. I was like, what? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, yeah, I was like two here, three here, two here. I was like, <laughs> like, why do you have that information in your head? She's like, cause I was trained to was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> That's kind of cool. I will <laughs> not uh, divulge the identity. <laughs> <laughs> No, we were. <laughs> I, I'd never experienced that before. We were playing around with that, um, but it wasn't me actually. There was a different dom, and she told me that story, and I was actually reinforcing it. So uh, during our plays, because I, I played with her several times, she's actually one of my closest friends. Also, whenever we do like uh, events or parties, she's always there, hmm. and uh, she always helps me out. She's also been through like some really serious stuff. She's performed in public before. Hmm. Um, we've did, we've done group activities before where she was in, um, and Jane is the same thing, but they actually have a different threshold. She has a lower thresh, a lot lower threshold than Jane does. Like for pain or like to come, um, or both. If I'm not mistaken, both. She actually tends to to we call it a safe word mm. to stop uh, at a particular level, but. Um, with orgasm, she goes on and on. Like, uh, there was one time, yeah, just more than seven. I think she does, she, she can go in a series. Jade is the is the, uh, complete opposite. She gets about two or three. But mostly at the time, I would notice she passes out. Mm. That's how I know she just came once or twice. Mm. She'd pass out. But it takes her a while to, to get there. Did, did she come when I was with her? 
Jane? Yeah. Yeah, that last part. Okay. And then before we transferred from the bed, she oh. came twice on the bed. Okay. And then, <laughs> and then I think she came, I don't know, I'm not sure if once on the chair. Because hmm. when you, when uh, we lied her down, you, you, you laid the, the chair down. Right. I think she, she did one there. And then one was when uh, we brought her back up. Gotcha. <laughs> so, so hard to tell with a girl. <laughs> It's like there's um me it's because of experience I've been here for quite a while so I know mm. but if it's the first time it's like you, you yeah. can tell there's this a uh, uh, sex researcher kind of like the McKinsey style like masters of sex thing there's uh -huh. somebody in the US I forget her name but um she's kind of doing some sex sexuality research um, okay. around the physiology and uh they developed this um butt plug that like measures uh anal um what do you call it? Like uh, contractions, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, like, really? like sphincter contractions, because supposedly that's like the gold standard of whether a girl had an orgasm or a, a girl or a guy mm -hmm. have an orgasm. Is like if their if their butt doesn't contract, <laughs> then like yeah. technically they didn't have an orgasm. So I'm thinking I should I should like make one or get one, <laughs> like just stick just it in, tell. just get that data. You know, <laughs> I don't know. It'd be so interesting. One of my tells is. Um, because the way the female, well, during um, our time as a fetus, right? Mm. The, we're it's asexual. We're both mm. just one, like just you know, single horse. cell. Yeah. You know, so we don't we we don't get the sex thing until like I think the first trimester. Okay, I think I, if I'm not mistaken, so, I can check that out. So you get your balls and your penis right. around third or fourth month, right? Mm. But everything all down there is basically the same shape and size and and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So in real life, actually, the 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 female uh, clitoris mm -hmm. and that hole underneath it, if it were a penis, the clitoris is the penis, and the hole is where your your urethra would be, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that. That whole long thing is gone. The muscle for the penile muscle is out. And you just have that small nerve ending yeah. uh, for the clip. So when guys come, your 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 dick actually throbs. Mm. It's the same with a girl. Mm. So their clit would throb. Mm. So that's how you know that they done their first orgasm. That's interesting. And the next one is the same with the anus, and you're doing this with your hand, is their vaginal muscles clinch. Mm. So it's the same thing. You don't need the, the butt mm. plug. <laughs> you're using your hands. Man. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you should pay attention to that. Mm. I could show you a video. <laughs> <laughs> I have a video of that that, can, that, that uh, tells you, really. So, Good idea. Mm -hmm. But that's that's just from experience. Like, I didn't figure that out until like the third or fourth girl that we're playing was like, okay. I've never even noticed that. Yeah. Check it out. All right, I'll have to pay attention. Because <laughs> like sometimes it's kind of like your dick. Like you know, like a girl can sort of make you, um, like not throb, but like mm -hmm. like one time, like your dick can kind of like move. Uh huh. If she like. Uh, tickles it a little mm -hmm. bit or something like that, you know? Yeah, but that's just like one. Yeah, just one. Like, I, I've noticed that uh -huh. on the clip, but I haven't uh -huh. noticed when you when a girl has an orgasm, it like, it yeah, it like, there's like, like a rhythmically, yeah, mm -hmm. I didn't notice. It. it pulls up like that. I'm going to, so I have a video online that can show that. Perfect. Shit. All right, cool. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> sharing, sharing, <Yeah. laughs> sharing material, yeah. sharing lessons, you know? That's what it is. <laughs> you have to educate. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> um, oh, so 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 your girlfriend at the time was like the first person you met, and then uh, how long after that until you sort of met like a wider community, maybe like some guys or something? Who, um, guys, not not too much until I came. Uh, I was working professionally, but girls. I had two other girlfriends. Mm -hmm. This one. And then I had a vanilla girlfriend. She was perfectly plain, mm -hmm. which is fine. I didn't have any complaints. And then I had another girl who also discovered she was kinky because we were playing around. And then I suddenly decided, can we try something else? And I started tying her up. And it was in reverse. I was the one teaching her now. 
So, mm-hmm. plus I had this stage that I had to understand how it feels like being tied. Mm. So this girl that I was teaching, she was actually also tying me up, mm. which she said she was not going to do again because I was boring. Because mm. whenever I get tied up, I get to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, it's just, it's boring for me. It was like, never mind. I just <laughs> fall asleep. So it's always me that does the tying. But I had I had that stage that I had to understand how it feels like to be bound, and what are the dangers that I have to 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 be aware of. So even right now with lessons from from the senior doms and the dominants, the female doms, like if you're gonna try a toy out, you need to try it on yourself. Good thing I don't try dildos, you know. <laughs> so, but you know, impact toys like paddles, whips, uh, canes, and floggers. If you can't take it, don't expect the other person to. If you can't take it. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's kind of like a rule that if you're playing with something like if you if you want yourself bleeding, then you have to try it. You have to try it. Yeah. So So it took a while before you met some other people. Oh um, yeah, um and then like what like cuz that was that was the the Manila <laughs> community at that time right it was just community. just you and a couple other people and then years later around 2004 was the first time i met my because I, I started visiting forums mm. and then there was this one forum was which is like you know the usual forums where you discuss about politics and they discuss about you know motorcycles and cars and there was one like you know personal you know topics and then there's one uh, discussion like you know somebody was talking about bdsm mm. but nobody was really like discussing anything like you know and i was there and i was like i started discussing stuff and people were like oh okay this guy knows stuff you know mm. as i was <laughs> saying passing out <laughs> so yeah it's, it's not like it's dangerous um when you're playing with, with bdsm and that type of uh Behavior, because uh, it doesn't happen to anybody. Hmm. It's uh, they just have too much. I, like they get too much sensation, and then the body can't process it, and hmm. they just. And in this case, some women just just scream and scream and scream, and they let all their air out, hmm. and then they la- They don't have enough air, and then they just conk out. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like hyperventilating. Hyperventilating, right? So. You just have to pay attention because if when if they tie if they're tied to a chair or to a bed to a table they pass out that's fine, but if a person is standing up and they pass out they fall so yeah. you just have to be pretty you know hmm. uh, like let's say I, I saw one of your videos um, you were actually playing with this Chinese girl I think she was wearing like a corset. Uh, and she right. was kneeling on the bed, right? And you were stimulating her while you were while she was kneeling. Yep. And there was a point that her head was throwing back. Mm-hmm. You can see it because your your face was on her. Okay. And I think she felt like she was going to fall down, so she reached out and yeah, yeah. embraced you. Uh. So I at that point I was I was looking at it, it's like she's going to pass out. Uh. <laughs> Interesting. So she just reached out and, and, and grabbed you because she was falling back. Okay. So it's, it's kind of like her knees were a little, like, from, like, what, what I would have thought was, like, you know, her knees are a little shaky or something. She's, she's getting a little, like, a little mm-hmm. jello-y. But... That's also, yeah. It, yeah. It, but it, I, I, think, I think you probably have the right way of actually thinking about it, which is, it's like a pass, she's, like, close to passing out. Mm-hmm. Do you think that the physiological process is, is the, the oxygen? Is It's the oxygen, because most of the time... In my observation, whenever we're we're playing sensation play, you don't breathe normally. You don't mm. do that. <gasps> yeah. Usually they do. <sighs> yeah. <sighs> Short breath, mostly exhale, exhale. Mm. and then when they start to scream, people just scream out. Yeah. Where they just exhale the whole time, and then they empty their stomach and their lungs, mm. and then they hold their breath. Mm-hmm. And that's that actually that actually conks them out. Interesting. Yeah, I, I did something called um, rebirthing meditation before, mm-hmm. which I think is kind of a wonky thing. But it, it's basically you just lie on the floor and you just hyperventilate, 
And, uh, and then you, like, you, you do get into sort of an altered state. Mm-hmm. I only did it once. Um, and then I read up on it. I was like, oh, it's just lying on the floor hyperventilating. It's kind of silly. <laughs> it's like I'm glad I didn't have a huge meal because I would have just thrown up everywhere. Uh, but, but you do get into, like, an altered state. And, like, mm-hmm. you know, and then your, your jaw clenches up. And, you're, like, that was one thing that I noticed. And mm-hmm. I read later that, like, that was a symptom. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, like, for a couple hours after that, I was, like, you know, just a little bit, like, foggy you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, felt like I had some clarity or something during the moment, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it f- felt like something happened, mm-hmm. uh, and then afterwards quite tired. So another symptom of, uh, when a person passes out mm-hmm. is that the moment they come to, they get a moment of, uh, disorientation. Mm. Like they don't know where they are and it actually adds up to, it adds up to the experience. Because when they're bound, when they're tied up, let's say they're tied up to a chair or to a table, and then they pass out, and then you it's up to you. You can continue with the sensation or you can stop the sensation. But what I do is I continue with the sensation, and then they come to, and then their body doesn't know where they are. Yeah. They feel something, and then coupled with a blindfold or a gag, um, they don't have the power of sight. Mm -hmm. And everything is just sensation in the body Uh that heightens your sensation or that heightens their sensation like two or three fold. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, they're already having already getting that that uh, a a lot of stimulation and that happens. And then more stimulation comes in. Mm -hmm. So a while ago, when you were talking about these endorphins that they secrete during uh, uh, play it goes up more or if it goes down and then they pass out and then they come back to, it goes back up. Mm. So there, it's also a way like a technique. If you want to prolong uh play or you want to prolong the sensation, it's also something that you can, you know, keep in your toolbox. Mm. So you just have to remember that after that, after that, you can't like just walk out and, you know, grab a pizza. They really need to lie down. Um, oh, there's a, you need to learn the concept of aftercare. Hmm. Um, where you actually have to be there and process it with them. So some actually like the concept, you know, their aftercare is like taking a hot shower or just cuddling in the bed or eating something sweet or more, mm-hmm. <laughs> eating more mm-hmm. <laughs> or for some reason. Some like, can we order pizza? Okay, fine. <laughs> that's their aftercare and then there are some people that just want to sit down and talk about it mm-hmm. they don't necessarily have to be touching or connecting with you yeah. but they can sit down and just say how do you feel and then they can process it with words mm-hmm. and that a lot, yeah. yeah so this, that's that's also so for those that are not as vocal uh jade is not very vocal so um, she she actually not, not vocal talking. <laughs> not vocal talking. Vocal screaming. Vocal screaming. Yeah, that vocal talking when she's she when we do when we do uh, you know sessions. Yeah. But it's 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 um it's more uh, sensual in her case. She, she needs to be cuddled and touched and uh, and hugged. So most of the time it's always like you know blankets, thick blankets, water. Um, and then after that, she goes to sleep. Um, that night, uh, when we got home, so we checked into Rosal Hotel. Mm-hmm. She slept for like 16 hours. Like, really? <laughs> wow. And then she woke up horny as hell. It's like, <laughs> what the I was watching TV and she like, you know, she just grabbed me in the back and she was, you know, started raping me. That's her fault. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway. So yeah, yeah, she was, uh, you know, pretty much um, uh, wasted that night. That's why she wasn't able to speak, you know, on the way out. Yeah, she's she was hearing. telling me about the yeah. that thing, yeah. and um, she had a difficult time articulating because most of the time, that's it's basically it. every time we do a session like that, I had to carry her to the bed, and then mm-hmm. she needs to sleep. Wow. Um. So. Getting back to rope, um, like we're, we're just kind of wrapping up here, but like what's mm-hmm. what's uh, the thing that you're most interested in now? Because because you've gone through a whole progression over mm-hmm. decades, really. I mean, so what's what's something that still interests you now? Actually, there's still a lot of things that because uh, 
with every person that you actually interact with, there's no, no two people alike. I mean, they might look alike. They might have the same body type and everything. But the way the sensation is, you know, uh, the way they react to the sensation is always different. Mm. There's no two people alike. And that's the thing that I like the most. It's the uniqueness of it. Being able to experience something new with some some person is is amazing. It's not like, you know, this is this is something that you don't see every day. You don't get to see at all. You go to a room and make a girl orgasm. I mean, there's a lot of talk online of guys not being able to provide the right sensation and girls not being able to reach their big O. And here we are, you know, sitting in that room doing things that can make this girl scream and, you know, squirm and cry and pass out. That's that's to me. That's that's really interesting. It doesn't it doesn't get old. Mm. You don't get tired of it, mm. and you want to make more, uh, learn more. Like in your case, like right now, you're trying to incorporate rope. You're trying to incorporate uh, other sensations into the play. It it that's the one that actually encourages us to to learn more, and it's not a selfish thing because you're actually you know. Some people learn for selfish reasons. The, 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 the interesting part about what we do is that the, the sharing, the dynamic, is an exchange. Mm-hmm. They, get, they get something, we get something. Mm-hmm. So, although I'm still pretty much with rope, I still teach, I still um, try to learn a lot of other techniques when it comes to rope, but the basic core of it is actually just being able to provide that type of, you know, pleasure, the type of sensation that you can all, then you get to be a witness to it, mm-hmm. which is a rare thing. So you're not just, yeah, that, that makes sense. So it's like if the girl doesn't <laughs> respond to rope, then you just don't use rope. Right? Yeah. You're not like the rope guy. You're just like the make the girl come out of her mind guy, basically. Well... The, that's the thing is because like I said we before a session you actually talk about mm-hmm. it and if if you talk about it and say oh I'm not into you know and I would actually say no because mm-hmm. it's something that I like and it's something that she does not like it's I won't be able to provide you know the the tools for her because it's something that but the the fortunate thing about this because my profile does show a lot of rope bondage most of the people that approach me are into rope so mm-hmm. i don't usually get uh people that are not into it mm-hmm. it's always although i've i've had like you know the boyfriend would be the one contacting me hey mm-hmm. can you can we have like uh you know two guys one girl you tie my girl up and then we play around you know yeah, but I need to talk to your girlfriend. It's like, you know, I need to ask her if she's she's into it. You know, yeah. she likes it. If she's not, then I'll pass. Yeah. And then the girl would say, oh, yes, yes, and everything, and yes, and yes, just to please the guy. Mm. And then you go to a session. You tie them up. They look bored as hell. Oh, know? yeah. That, that, that brings me out. I'll just sit down and watch you guys do your own thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, while she's tied up. And then after five minutes, I take her, you know, take away the rope. And they, they do their own thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just pack up and go. I had this one guy contact me. He was like, I want to give my girl a sensual massage. And then I want you to come in and like take over and give her, like make her squirt. And then uh, before she finds out, we'll switch back. And then you, and you leave. I'm like, that, no, like that's probably breaking laws. <laughs> and like, that's just stupid. She'll find out anyway. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. Even with this before, like I, there's a lot of girls that are into abduction play. Mm-hmm. And that takes a lot of freaking planning, man. Like before, like in 2000, like 2010, 2009, 2008, it was a lot easier because there were a lot less cameras okay. in the metro. And like parking lots would have like like dark spaces where you can actually go in and plan this. So I used to do that. We used to do that with a friend that has a car. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, this girl would negotiate. We had we would clearly state what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, but not when. But we, it's down to when and where. 
Oh, you do win and wear. Mm -hmm. We okay. do win and wear. I thought it'd be like a surprise. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do a little bit of play, like um, uh, we do we do the win and wear, but we don't we don't tell her where she's going to be picked up. Oh. So I'd say, oh, we're going to meet in the in the mall, hmm. and then we go to the parking in the mall, the parking lot in the mall, and then the the the, the vehicle is already situated in the far corner where there's no camera. Well, two thousand. Eight, there wouldn't be too much cameras back then. Sure. Uh, the technology was still pretty, you know, new here. So I'd bring her to the far corner on a blank, like, you know, um, a negative space, mm -hmm. if, if in case there is a camera, like behind the vehicle. Mm -hmm. I'd semi-tie her up and then throw her in the, the vehicle. So one person would be driving, the other person would be in the back playing with her. Mm -hmm. So it's like that, and then we bring it to one place, and then, yeah, so we do stuff. The place is, because motels right now, there's called a garage room, where you actually park your car into the motel. They close the door, and then there's a stair going up to the room where the the room boys won't yeah. disturb you. Yeah, so you so don't have we, to go through reception. Yeah, we don't up. have to go through reception. So we just park the car in, the room boy goes out, he prepares the room, the room boy goes out, I go back on the... The car, open the door, pull her out. She's already naked, tied mm -hmm. up, blindfolded, gagged, and we bring her up to the room. Hmm. And that completes the sensation for her. The mm -hmm. moment she gets to the room, she's crazy as hell. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so we did that a couple of times, more than a couple of times. I think we did it twice. But then again, this, this along coming into this year, more and more cameras are being set up, even in just the, you know, just the road and... Uh, <laughs> It wouldn't be nice to like have a security cam or police cam suddenly like capture like oh that's the plate number you know they abducted a girl and oh no this is all you know yeah screwed up <laughs> yeah no that's not a it's so, not a good look we've had a we've had a few uh, although there was this one there, we had this one hotel um, in the, somewhere in Pasig where they had that type of hallway where there's like a door right and then the hallway doesn't have cameras cameras for some reason so we did that because it was a longer hallway because it was a it's a motel so the hallway was long the room was in the far end there were other rooms here that maybe had people in them and i ordered the girl to strip mm -hmm. i had a bag yeah take off her clothes except for her high-heeled shoes and then bound her put a collar around her neck and a chain mm -hmm. and I had to walk her from that corner down to the, the room which is on the far end mm -hmm. and as I was walking her down she was already like her eyes were glassy her, she was staring down on the ground she was half looking at me I was just walking her and then one of the rooms just opens up <laughs> and then a guy steps out with a phone it's like <laughs> it's just like that and she goes she just goes with her head down I was just like I'm just walking here man <laughs> so she, this guy just like like straight up like I don't know if she took a count she, he, he took a photo of her behind but I don't yeah. care yeah. You know, it's just her behind just a butt mm -hmm. just another butt on the internet <laughs> so the moment that we got to the room that just that idea of exposing her because there are people that are actually because she's an exhibitionist. She actually likes to be, I, or the idea of being seen. I know some exhibitionist girls. Right. They, they, they kind of come to me. You get the rope girls, I get the exhibitionist girls. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, something like that. So, that turns them on. Hmm. And the moment we got to the room, she was already, like, you know, crazy as hell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even crazier than before going to the place. So, something like that. Cool. Yeah, so it's not just rope. It's, it's mm -hmm. whatever. It's... It's just playing around, just being creative, mm -hmm. like, uh, like you know, because like I said before that, you just, you talk to them, get to know what they like, and then you can play around with that idea. Being able to play around is actually the fun part, mm -hmm. like figuring out how you're going to do this, how you're going to do that. And then if you get to pull it off, oh, it's just amazing. It's like just getting like a like whole production number perfectly you know executed yeah <laughs> i know what you mean and then the payoff is just like when she screams i, I oh. think there's there's something about like like you watch like uh like a guy and a girl having sex and like usually the girl's out of her mind you mm -hmm. know just like screaming or whatever or just sort of like in her own world and the guy's just like looking at her 
you know, mm-hmm. just like sort of sucking it in. Just that, that's sort of like the payoff. I think it's like if, if, if you have sex with a girl and she's not into it. Yeah. She's not like, uh, you know, like expressive. It's just like nothing. That's why I kind of, I was in high school when, <laughs> when one of my friends kind of like, we got, we kind of got this paid girl, mm-hmm. like a hooker. Yeah. That was boring as hell. Like, yeah. Doesn't, doesn't mean anything at all. Like, you know, but, you know, but with this, it's like, they call it a power exchange mm-hmm. where this person, let's go of that power and gives it to you. Mm-hmm. And you hold that power, but you're not drunk with power. You're also responsible for that power mm. to build trust. So it's the same thing with your scenario. They, those, this whole thing, they give up that power and give it to you. Mm-hmm. And that power is the one that circulates into you. Mm-hmm. And then you give it back through this means. And like Spider-Man says, with great power, power. comes great <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> So that wraps up. Yeah, yeah, right? <laughs> Bringing it all back. Ropes, Spider Man, it all makes sense. Now. It all makes sense. Oh my God. I had a friend who actually cosplays as Spider Man, and her girlfriend uh, came to me for a rope uh, photo shoot. And he was there, and he was like, Dude, can you tie me up upside down like Spider Man? Why? And he whips up his phone and he's got this kick ass Spider Man costume. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no problem, dude. I get the white rope. You mm-hmm. put on the costume. Let's make it, let's make it happen. So he got the upside down kiss. <laughs> yeah, got him the upside, upside down kiss, there right? With the girlfriend. <laughs> and her girlfriend, uh, his girlfriend is really, really cute. Like, she's also a small girl, short hair, short purple hair. And they did the uh, the Spider Man kiss mm-hmm. with him upside down. Mm-hmm. Iconic Except for the water. Because <laughs> we were we were saying, should we do the water? Like you know, can we get water? a hose? Because it was raining. The scene was raining. Oh, okay, yeah. Then wow. uh, we you tried. Cos- we you cosplayers. We tried it splashing water at him a few times, but the mask was on his nose, uh. and she was he was like being waterboarded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he yeah. Couldn't yeah. Breathe. yeah. It's like, okay, never mind. Let's forget the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so uh, if people want to reach out to you on FetLife, how do what's where do they where do they find you? Oh, they just they just go to Manila Fet. Mm-hmm. That's uh, capital M uh, for Manila, and then connected with Fet capital F. Okay. And no, no space. Just, no space. Just yep. look for me, Shinobi underscore Sensei. So I'm there. I'm the owner, and they just can. Click on my name, and that's it. Sounds good. And Shinobi is S H I N O B I underscore underscore Sensei. Sensei. So Shinobi um, is commonly known as Ninja in in uh, uh, another term in American language, hmm. but the actual Japanese translation is Secret Old Guy. <laughs> okay. Secret old guy. Secret old guy. And then sensei is Japanese for teacher. Mm. So that's it. Awesome. Hey, well, thank you very much for uh, you know, no problem. chit-chatting. Thanks for listening. And I want to thank my sponsors. I'm just kidding. I don't have any sponsors. I'm just doing this to connect with people in kink because I'm pretty vanilla and I want to figure out what all this kinky shit's about. If that resonates with you, join me on the journey and subscribe so you get all the next episodes. And you can also join in on the conversation by going to FetLife.com, finding my profile, Hunk Hands, like a hunky guy and hands with a with an S, Hunk Hands. And on my profile, you're going to see a journal entry with the show notes, and that's where you can comment, you can tag friends, you can like, and you can interact. So if you haven't already done it and you want to follow the show, hit that subscribe button and get all the next episodes. And thanks to I Hate This Place for the show music. See you next week.